No, the mind that's set on self is just sad and small. So God's heart is instead to be the glory and the lifter of your head. The one who helps you refocus and live in that place of supernatural peace. You know, the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost was quite a remarkable thing when you look at it. There they were gathered in Jerusalem where Jesus had been crucified. He'd been raised again. They'd been told to tarry in Jerusalem until the promise of the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They had received the Holy Spirit as Jesus breathed on them post-resurrection, but he still said, but wait, there's more. And as they did, oh, they were clothed with power from on high. And tongues of fire appeared on their heads. They spoke with other tongues. And then they spilled out of the room and began preaching and proclaiming the good news of the gospel. Now, Peter had denied Christ in Jerusalem not that long before. And yet when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he received boldness where he no longer cared about himself and his own safety. He was so filled with the Holy Spirit that he was set free from self-centeredness that would keep him from shining the light of God. The Holy Spirit gives us power to be free from self. Hooray! He set me free from me. He loves you. He, li he lives in you. If you've received him as Savior and Lord, he wants to come upon you. He wants to continually fill you. And he loves the way he made you, but he didn't make you to be self-focused. He made you to be God-focused. Hallelujah. And there is freedom and power that comes when we have our eyes fixed on him. Hallelujah. We sang uh, last week that old Keith Green song. It's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. Because it's true. If you're looking at yourself, you don't see the glory and you are focused on trying to look after yourself. And God wants you to know that there is a better way. There is a higher way. Amen. He gives us freedom to think about the needs of others. We've been having a look through Philippians chapter 2, which is a beautiful book. If you um, want to have a read through the whole book, it's just a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a good and healthy thing to, to read through whole books of the Bible. Even in a sitting, you could read through Philippians and then go back and go slowly and let the Lord speak to you. Let him encourage you. Let him teach you. Because there's so much in the living word of God that he wants to equip you with. But Philippians 2 is so fascinating. And it, it really, we've been talking about not living a self-centered life and the joy and the freedom that comes from considering the needs of others above your own. You know, it's, it's about having our eyes so filled with his wonder and his goodness that instead of being afraid that you're not going to get what you need and being afraid, you are filled with the faith of Christ that trusts him, that enters the rest, believing God is for me. Who can be against me? He supplies all of my needs according to his riches in glory. I don't have to worry about getting stuff for myself because I am filled up. I have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. Therefore, freely I've received, freely I can give. Hallelujah. And, but the, at the center, really, of a self-centered life, which, by the way, is what society will tell you is a, the highest moral value. Look after yourself. What about me? But the truth is, it's a, it's a lower life that leads to a small little confined life and actually at the root of it is pride and pride comes before a fall it's because if you're looking at yourself you can't see where you're going and you fall over it doesn't lead to life but life is found with you is life hallelujah i am the way the truth and the life hallelujah as we put our eyes on him in his light we see light hallelujah 
And, but sometimes we think that, you know, when you say the word pride, you think of the arrogant or the boastful or the ones that like to talk over the top of you. As soon as you start saying something, they've got to tell you uh, how it's relating to them and it's all about me. Have you ever met people like that? Don't, don't say, hallelujah. Or have you ever been a person like that? That's typically what we identify as pride. But, you know, pride is insidious. It can come in all sorts of forms. Pride can even be at the root of people who isolate themselves because they don't want to talk to strangers because they're thinking about themselves and their own comfort. Or even for those that feel like, I don't want to talk to people because I think they're going to reject me, it's still about me. It's still self-focused. And that self-focus doesn't lead you into joy. It doesn't protect you. What it does is it actually leads you deeper and deeper into a pit that is so difficult to get out of when you are continually looking at yourself. But the good news is, in his light, we see light. Uh, There's a saying that humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. The truth is God's not looking for us to live a life where we just we consider ourselves dirt and rubbish. He's simply asking us to give our full focus to him. Believe what he says about us and just agree with him. And then in the freedom of knowing you are loved and that you are cared for in the faith that he wants to release to your heart, you can overflow and be a blessing to others. Even psychologists will tell you that the joy of giving actually releases endorphins that, that make you happier. So the, it, the truth of that it's more blessed to give than to receive is actually scientifically proven. There's actually greater levels of joy that come in, in being able to give. But this message isn't some pop psychology or self-help. This is the Word of God, and His ways are higher than our ways. Amen? Scripture says if we seek to save our lives, we'll lose them. But that's what society teaches us. Look after number one. But in trying to look after ourselves and trying to get what we need for ourselves, being self-focused, we actually lose our lives. But if instead we bring our lives to the altar every day, we say, thank you, Lord. It's no longer me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Lord, I present myself as a living sacrifice today. Thank you, Father. I have the mind of Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for the freedom and the power by the Holy Ghost to fill me today, to overwhelm me so that everywhere I go, I can be a blessing. I can be the light of the world. I don't have to be self-focused. As we do that, we find life. Hallelujah. And we enter into the fullness of the river of his joy. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, this whole concept of looking at ourselves, keeping our eyes on ourselves, is really, it's a lack of faith. It's saying, I don't trust you to look after me. Matthew chapter 6, 25 tells us, why do you worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what's going to happen tomorrow? The heathens worry about this. Like the Lord's saying, this isn't for you. You weren't created for worry. You know, I I think about it, and I, I was reading last night Psalm 37. Who loves the Psalms? I love it. Psalm 37 is one of my favorites, and it's it's beautiful. I, if I could, I'd read the whole psalm to you today because it would just do you good. But as you read the whole psalm, Psalm 37, it's fascinating. It's, it's talking about the wicked and it's talking about the righteous and it's, it's saying, don't worry about the wicked. Don't fret because of evildoers. I'll read just a little bit because it's delicious. Starts off, don't fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of workers of iniquity, for they'll soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he'll bring it to pass. 
All the way through this psalm, we read about, don't worry about what everybody else is doing. You just live in the land of your promise Live in faith in the promises that he's given to you. Feed on his faithfulness. I like it over, over um, further. You can read about how he wants us to, to feast on the, the abundance of peace. Hallelujah. He wants us to enjoy his presence. And, and he says, I know about the wicked and I know that they plot and they do all sorts of stuff. But he says, don't you worry about that. He says, instead, delight yourself in the abundance of peace. Hallelujah. And, and he makes it clear, I know about this. I know about them. But hey, you can trust me. I'm not blind. I see what goes on. Sometimes people get so twisted up. Oh, I've got a justice. Prophets are supposed to be justice people. And, and they use it as an excuse to go and stick the sword in everybody else. This is not the way of the Lord. God actually tells us in Scripture to mind our own business. It doesn't mean that we're blind to injustice. And if you are responsible for it, you know, don't let your kids just muck up and do terrible things. Discipline them, you know, be, demonstrate what a good father is. But if it's not your responsibility, trust God is well able to take care of it. And you do what you're called to do, and that is dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness, delight yourself in the abundance of peace. Hallelujah. I'm preaching good. It's in the Bible. Oh, I tell you, good stuff. You know, we had a um, family get together yesterday, and we love it. We, we do it once a year for Mother's Day, and it was belated obviously, but you know, the family get together and we have lunch and we sit around and my daughter and my son-in-law brought their little baby, little Lincoln, you've met Lincoln, he's very cute, five months old, and at one point I'm sitting on the couch with my sister and we're both looking at Lincoln as Jess is holding Lincoln and saying, hello Lincoln, oh you're so beautiful, and one of my other sisters said, I wish I had a video of you too, you're just like, ah. <laughs> And the truth is, it's because we were waiting for the reward, which was his smile. And the more he smiles, the more you want to do it. He said, yeah, and yeah, now I'm going to see if I can make you laugh. <laughs> You're looking at someone doing that, you think they're crazy. But the motivation to see the little one laugh is very strong. The motivation to see them smile is a parent's reward. It's a grandparent's reward, right? Parents and grandparents, you know what I'm talking about. I said the other night that we were playing um, a game this week, one night during the week, and with all the kids, and I mean, the kids are grown up and tall. Um, but I tell you, I just sat there going, oh, I want them to win, because when they're winning, they're smiling. Or, or when, they, when they cheer, because they got it. I'm like, yes. They got it. And that's what happens. There's this metamorphosis that happens when you become a parent. You're, you know, I'm very competitive. But all of a sudden, it's like, I just want them to go well. Because them smiling is much more rewarding than you winning. That's why parents sometimes let their children win. Hallelujah. I didn't let them win. But I, I, I did get happy when they did. But this is just a little picture of how God feels about us. He wants us to win. He wants us to be filled with joy. He wants us to live in peace. You say, well, where is that in Scripture? Right here, actually, in Psalm 37. In fact, it's actually all the way through Scripture. Look at the beginning. When God created them, he blessed them to be fruitful and to multiply. In number six, he spoke over them and said, this is how I want you to speak over my people. I want you to bless them. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. He'd say, I want you to 
Uh, delight yourself in the abundance of peace. I want to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. Hallelujah. And then through scripture, uh, Jesus is saying, I want you not to be worried about stuff that everybody else is worried about. Trust me, I'll take care of you. I want you to be the light of the world. I want you to drink deeply of the river of my pleasure. Even when the world hates you, there is oil and wine that I have mandated cannot be touched because it's yours. You can drink deeply of the river of my pleasure for you at any moment. You can continually drink in the oil and the wine. Revelation 6.6, 6, in the midst of all the tribulation and the turmoil, the Lord says, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Because in the midst of it all, you have access to the same thing Stephen had access to while they were gnashing their teeth at him. The Bible says his face shone like that of an angel. Because where we put our focus is what will manifest on our faces. Where we are looking is what will manifest in our lives. And that is what living a life, preferring others, loving God with all our hearts and loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving God, loving people, is, sums up the whole scripture. Because God knows if you're doing that, <sighs> receiving his love, giving it away, loving him, loving people. You are going to live in a place of continuous joy and the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Hallelujah. He doesn't say that in this world it's going to be roses all the time. He says in this world you will have trouble. But he says, don't complain and worry and get anxious. In fact, Philippians 2 goes on to say, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. The people would know you by your love, not by your opinions. I have to put my opinions on the altar every day. Like, man, I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> and I've had to begin to learn. I'm beginning to learn. It's a lesson that Tom's helping me learn. Hallelujah. <laughs> that I need to actually put these opinions on the altar and say, hey, thank you, God. I need more of your love so that my opinions don't just cut people but instead, Lord, I want to have your mind. I want to be thinking about how they're feeling, what they're thinking. I want, to, I want to consider others above my own desire to share my own opinion. In so many ways, the Holy Spirit wants to help us, empower us to enter into the abundant life that is free from self-centeredness. Amen? You know, the mind that's set on self is just sad and small. And then the, uh, the mind that's set on everybody else is just judgmental and proud. And all of it just leads to a fall. So God's heart is instead to be the glory and the lifter of your head. The one who helps you refocus and live in that place of supernatural peace. You remember the story of Jesus sleeping in the storm? The storm's raging. They're, they're going to die. They're like, go and wake Jesus up. Why doesn't he do something? And he's sleeping. And so I can picture the picture. Jesus, help. Wake up. Don't you know we're perishing? He'll be like, huh? Oh. Storm, stop it. Peace. And turns around to them, basically, this is a Catherine paraphrase, and says, why didn't you just do that? Because he released what he held on the inside. He had peace. He lived in the place of peace. Hebrews chapter 4 is fascinating, if you want to look at, there, uh, look at that with me. Hebrews 4 talks about this rest of faith. And there's something so powerful when we learn how to enter in 
dwell in the land, live in the promised land of resting in faith in what God has promised. We can read it from the beginning. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. I think, unfortunately, many of us live our whole lives short of the abundance of peace that God wants us to live in. Psalm 37 tells us, I want you to feast and enjoy, delight yourself in the abundance of peace. But many of us fall short of that, and this tells us why. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Because we didn't apply faith to what God said. He said, I've laid a banqueting table before you in the presence of your enemies. I've given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. But instead of mixing our faith with the truth of his promises, we think, I have to be worried because if I'm not worried about me, who's going to be worried about me? And we go into unbelief instead of entering the rest of faith, trusting that God is well able to take care of whatever the wicked one is trying to do, he will rescue me from every evil attack. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I, have no, I fear no evil for you are with me. Hallelujah. Though an army encamp against me in this, I will be confident. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my shield. Hallelujah. I'm surrounded by the favor of the Lord as with a shield. For we who have believed do enter that rest, the rest of faith, the promised land. You know, you might think, well, I'm waiting to live in my promised land. Well, just do. The Bible talks about being like the one you were created to be. That is imitating him who created the world with his words, who called those things that be not as though they were, who when he has spoken, just began to tell Abraham, I want you to call yourself father of many nations, as though it had already happened before he saw it manifest. That's what faith looks like. That's what the patriarchs are commended for, in that they believed because God said it. Because he said it, it's as good as done. Hallelujah. So I can rest in it. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to take back the concern. Because when you're thinking about yourself, you are stressed. You are anxious. You're concerned. What if, but, but, what if, but, but, what if, but, but, what if, but, but. You know, it sounds a bit like a, a broken car. Or actually, sometimes I see the young guys actually make their cars do that on purpose. Like, bop, 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 bop. I don't understand it. It's very strange. <laughs> actually, God wants you instead to enter the rest of faith, it's not a place of passivity. It's a place of actively resting. God's got this. I know. I can take his yoke upon me because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. I'm going to give my burden over, the burden of looking after myself and worrying about myself. I'm going to hand that over. I'm going to put my life, my concerns on the altar. Philippians 4, I'm going to bring everything in prayer with supplication, with thanksgiving. I'm going to make my requests known to God, and I'm going to thank him. It's done, and the peace of God is going to guard my heart today. I'm going to be known by the peace that he floods into my soul. I'm going to let go of every trace of self that would try to hinder the fullness of the flood of his peace. And I'm going to intentionally take captive every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ who is my savior, Christ who is my healer, Christ who is my provider, Christ who is my all in all, my life. Everything that lies against that is going to go, mm, taking you captive. No, not going to have that. And I'm going to refocus my thoughts on the one who is above for the mindset on him is life and peace. It's all about focus. It's all about faith. The more I think about him, the more I 
think about his promises, the more I feast on his word and trust. He is the one who has promised. He is the one who will also do it. Hallelujah. He is faithful. I can trust him. Hallelujah. The more I focus my thoughts on him, the more I enter into the rest of faith. Practically for me, it begins in the morning as I take communion with him, as I bring my prayers and requests before him. I, I bring my requests and I bring them with thanksgiving. Thank you for this one. Thank you for this person in my life. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for the answer to that prayer. Thanksgiving is an entryway into practical faith, to actually turning your eyes away from the situation and onto the one who is the answer to every situation. That's the way to do it, is to enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter his courts with praise. That's why Paul says, rejoice. And again, I say, because he knows it is the better way, the higher way, rather than be afraid, be very afraid, be anxious, be stressed, be concerned. Have you heard about this? You should be very concerned. Oh, have you seen the way the world's going? And the more I find actually, the more people worry and get concerned, the more they're like, oh, oh, do you think Jesus will come back soon? And it's not motivated by, I want Maranatha. Even so, Lord, come. It's motivated by the world's so terrible. So look, do you think we'll get out of here soon? Oh, Maranatha, even so, Lord, come. I want him to come. But I tell you, I don't want to live my life in a place of, of fear. Instead, I want to keep my eyes on him. Here's three things I do in my morning routine. And you may want to add them to yours. I take communion with the Lord, thanking Him for His body and His blood. I bring a list of requests before Him. I go through all the things and all the people and the situations pertaining to my life and I put them out on the altar of prayer before the Lord, waiting for His help and His blessing as I commit all of my ways and all of my day to the Lord. He brings His magnificent help. I read the Word, working my way through a book of the Bible, expecting the Holy Spirit to help me and to teach me, getting excited about the revelation that He has for me that day. I know the Lord is looking forward to meeting with you every day. Take time to intentionally bring your life before the Lord every day and He will pour His life into yours. I love to talk to our partners every month on Zoom. I get to tell them the latest thing that the Lord is doing and I get to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying and we get to pray together, to prophesy, to ask questions and discuss what the Lord is doing all over the earth. It's a really precious and powerful time and I'd love to invite you to become a monthly partner. I'd love to see you on our next Zoom.